All right. So welcome everyone. Um, this is teaching remotely with Google Apps and Chrome, specifically Chromebooks or the Chrome browser. Um, I'm Katie Morrow from ESU8, and I'm pleased to have Molly Ashoff as my co-host online. She's helping moderate the chat. So if you have any questions or technical issues, feel free to unmute yourself and ask them out loud or put them in the chat and she'll jump right on that. She'll also probably let me know when um, you can't hear me very well. Um, specifically, if, if I get that message that says my bandwidth is low, I may stop my video and that should help with at least bringing the audio through. But I also want everyone to know that this is being recorded. So if you have difficulties hearing me because your bandwidth is low, you can just watch this tomorrow on YouTube or maybe even later this afternoon and it won't sound garbled and it won't freeze because it's just recording my end. So um, tune into as much as you can and feel free to jump in. I'll try to save time at the end for questions specifically. And if you wanna ask them as you think of them in the chat, um, we can decide if we get to them in the middle of each section or we get to them at the end for sure. Um, this is really focused, like I said in the title, on things you can do with Google Apps as well as in a Chrome browser. Um, I just want to say that last week's recordings, and there's three different versions on the ESU8 YouTube channel right now, they dealt specifically with Apple devices. So how to do a um, teachable lesson, a video, um, sharing content, digital PDFs, whatever it might be from home for the Mac, the iPad, the iPhone. That was last week and you can definitely check those out there. But today we're gonna really focus on five big areas um, that are specific to Google tools and using a Chromebook or maybe even the Chrome browser on a non-Apple device. And I know that there's so many options and so many tools and so many tutorials out there. So I'm not gonna go super deep into any one of these. I just chose a few and I just chose a few um, resources to share them with you as well. So um, what we need to do here to um, get on the same page is just visit that URL that I had in the opening slides. It's bit.ly slash CL Google Chrome. And Molly will add that in the chat as well, just so that you can click on it if you would like, or you can write it down and use it later on. Um, you should see what I'm showing here on my screen right now, this blog post where, like I mentioned, I've taken those big topics and just tried to choose one really basic, simple getting started tutorial or website or video series. Um, and I've just highlighted those here. Um, at the end, we got some space for some additional links, but we're just gonna try to make everyone comfortable in getting started. And if you have additional questions or need more in-depth help on any one of these areas, that's why Molly and I are available for you to reach out to later on. Um, basically, the five kind of sections that I've set aside here, we're going to start with Google Classroom. We're going to spend some time in using the screen recording tool, Screencastify. Um, talk a little bit about YouTube and uploading videos to a YouTube channel. Use Google Meet as an option for sharing video or having video conferencing. And then finally end with a little section on going paperless and using PDFs in teaching remotely. Um, so again, if you are watching this recording, feel free to skip ahead to the sections that apply to you the most. And with that, I think we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, the very top link here that I put a couple of asterisks by is teaching from home with Google. And it's a really great general hub that Google has put together for us during this time. And so use this as a reference as well. It, it has far more information than I know of and that I'm able to share on this Zoominar. So you can um, see the sections as you scroll through this. And each one of those tools has additional resources when you click on it um, that would help you get started and work through all that you need to know there. So that's an easy hub to come back to um, whenever you are wanting to know more. 
Oh, and I probably had to uh, go back there. Okay. All right, so let's get started with Google Classroom. Um, the link that I've added to our handout is from Eric Kurtz, as well as a lot of these um, highlighted um, tutorial videos. He just does a really great job of explaining simply in simple language how to utilize the tool. And this is a whole series, so I didn't put just one video there, but you can definitely pick and choose what you want to use out of that video series to get started. Now, if you had a Google Classroom running already prior to our school closures, um, it makes sense to use that as your communication channel, as your way to disseminate information to students and families, and to basically do everything on there. Uh, and in the beginning, I kind of was you know, hesitant to recommend, oh, let's get our students into Google Classroom if we weren't already using it. But I really think that it's possible. So if you think after watching this that if you didn't have it set up already, you would be willing to try it, um, I would be hap happy to help you get that started too. You would just have to send additional communication to your students and get them in your class. You can see from my screen right here that um, this is already in the class that I'm taking a look at. But if you just simply go to classroom.google.com and sign in with your school Google account, most of our schools have Google Classroom enabled, and you'll be able to, up on the top right-hand corner, click the plus and create a class to get started. You just name your class, my first class. You don't have to have a section or a subject or a room. You can definitely change the banner across the top. There we go, and you can customize that with some of the themes that Google has or you can upload your own photo. And then you're basically ready to get started. Um, since we are not in the physical classroom with our students right now, you would wanna click on the people tab across the top here. And a lot of uh, people have asked, can I add another teacher, maybe a para or a co-teacher to share resources with? Definitely you can there, just put in their email. And then your students, you would just invite with email addresses. So if you have already have a class list of student email addresses, just paste them in there or type them in there and then send out that invite. Now in the classroom, we typically project the screen. We have students log in to classroom.google.com and then enter this code. But again, since they aren't in our physical classroom right now, we can add them with those email invites. Then once they're in that space, um, we can just start by sending out an announcement. Um, basically, there's two ways to view Cl Google Classroom. The first is the stream, and this is just a running, it's a feed of all the announcements, assignments, whatever, as they come, um, most recent at the top. And then there's classwork, and in classwork, you can create a more organized structure to the announcements that you send out, or the assignments, or the resources, the materials. You can actually create in here topics, which are like section headers. These could be your dates, like each week could be a section header, um, or it could be units or sections like homework and in, for enrichment, whatever it might be. Um, and then underneath of those topic headings, that's where you create your things, your assignments, your quizzes, your questions, which are like discussions and your materials. And then what's pretty nice about the classwork section is that you can drag and drop those things underneath of those headers. So that helps you um, add more organization and more structure to your content. Now I'm gonna go back home here using the three lines on the left top and then using that home. And I'm gonna go into this class that I just have um, very little started, but at least I do have some of those topics and some things underneath of those topics to show you how to get started. Um, we are going to start with just a discussion. So if we just create a question here and type, how are you doing? Um, notice that you can choose between short answer, which is the typical question, or you could just have a quick multiple choice poll there. Um, we do have some options on the far right. This is going to all students. I, I'm gonna do it ungraded. I can put an alert due date on it if I want them to respond by a certain date. 
and I can put it underneath of um, a topic in my um, organized outline there and decide if students can reply to each other and if they are, have the ability to edit their answer after they've already typed it. Um, just so you know, when you're in the classroom, teachers like to be able to um, take off that being able to edit their answer um, just in case they might change an answer that might be a correct response or an incorrect response. But there might be times when you want them to go back and edit their answer. So you would turn it on at the question level here. You can put additional instructions and you can attach additional materials too. So you could maybe post a video there that you wanted them to watch and then respond to the question. Um, but then basically you just click the blue ask button here in the top right and it'll show up in their stream as being um, something that was assigned and it will also be under classwork in that section that I put it on. Um, we can take a look at this now by switching over to the student view and we go to that classwork and here's the, the question that I just posted. I'll just view the question as a student and I'll say, I'm doing great. I'll click the little send arrow and now other students could come in and reply to me. Other students could add their own response to the class question. It's pretty straightforward there. Go back home, switch back to my teacher version here. That's under Katie. And we're gonna create our next artifact under Google Classroom. This time we'll do an assignment. So an assignment is, um, it's dual purpose. It not only sends something out to students, but it also asks for them to send something back to you. Um, there's lots of ways to do this. Um, maybe the easiest way would be, you know, submit your week one work here. So the students at home, maybe they're working still on physical worksheets, on paper-based worksheets. You could add additional instructions here, and then you can, um, you can also create a document of instructions, so like a Google document or a Google Slides presentation that's attached right to there. Um, and again, over here in the settings, we've got a point, a due date. Um, we can put it underneath of a topic. Let's just go under examples. And you can add a rubric. All that's great, but we're just starting really simple here with kind of like a Dropbox for students to submit what they did on paper. So I could just do a sign. And now when students see that assignment, they can attach, maybe they t t take pictures of their worksheets and attach them there. Or, um, you know, type on a Google Doc themselves and attach it there. So let's switch over really quick to the student view and see how that looked. So we'll go, and I didn't put a due date on it, so it didn't go to the stream, but I can go here in my organized um, topics, and it was called Submit Your Week One Work Here. I'm going to view the assignment and I can add or create, so I can attach a file. That would be maybe the, the photos that I would take of my worksheets and I would attach it there. Um, I can go to Google Drive and start a, create a new Google Doc and type up my, my answers or even insert the pictures into the Google Doc. I mean, you just have a lot of options here. Um, let's go ahead and just go to my Google Drive for an example here and I'll just grab something to show you what it looks like. Oh, let's go to whatever this is. We'll add that. And now as a student, oh, I don't own that file. Apologies there. Let's go add or create Google Drive into my recent. A good tip when you're using Google Classroom, especially as a teacher, is that if you want to use something from your drive, it's not a bad idea to open it up. Um, oh, this is a... Here, we'll attach this one, is to open it up um, before you come into classroom and then it'll show up in your recents. It's easier to find. Now we do have to submit this. So um, I'm gonna mark it as I've done it. Oh, I didn't attach work, but I'm still gonna mark it as done. There we go. And now uh, it tells me that I've turned it in and that's the only way that the student can see it or that the teacher can see it. Otherwise you just control what you see on your student side um, and you do have to hand it in your students have to click hand in and for the teacher to be able to see it now if i go to that submit your week one work 
there. I can see one person's turned it in, even though she didn't successfully attach the document. Um, I chose a file that was too big to upload, but um, you can see how it would be simple to attach a picture there or whatever it might be, a Google Doc where you typed your answers. Let's think about, again, as a teacher, another way to do an assignment. This time, we're gonna actually add something from our, our Google Drive that we've already created as a teacher. Again, because I've checked out a few things recently, they're gonna show up in, right away in my recents. Or another tip as a teacher is to make a folder that um, I like put an asterisk beside it so that when I sort it alphabetically by name, that folder comes right to the top with the star there on it, demonstration documents, so that I can get to the things that I want to use in Google Classroom really quick and easy. This is taking a second to load, there we go. And so maybe I wanna put in here a graphic organizer that I've created or a PDF I've uploaded from somewhere else. Or here is a Google Doc that I created as an assignment and I'm gonna click add. Now you'll see it's attached to the assignment down here, but this um, drop down choice right next to it is really important. Here the students can just view my Google Doc. If I wanted them to actually type on it, I would say students can edit the file. However, that would mean that all 20 students, for example, were editing that one Google Doc. The really powerful feature in doing assignments through Google Classroom is when you say make a copy for each student, because it'll automatically make a, a copy for each student of this Google Doc so that they can type their responses right on it, and it will also name it for them and save it back with the teacher um, in the right appropriate sharing settings and also store it in your Google Drive um, for both the student and for the teacher. It does all of that just by clicking this option right here, make a copy for each student. Um, again, if you put a due date on it, they're gonna get more of a notification of when it's due and then it'll also alert you if they hand it in late. You can organize it by topic here or you can drag and drop it later. But we're just gonna say, um, try this April 1st there we go we're gonna assign that and I'm gonna switch back over here to the student view in a second we'll see if it saves even though it's slow to react there and we'll go back home here by clicking on the the home version go back to classwork We'll find that um, assignment that I just did that's not showing up. <laughs> Be, there it is, try this April 1st. All right, I'm gonna view that assignment as a student. Here was my questions that, um, there we go. I have taught for whatever many years. There we go, I'm typing my own responses on my own document. It's automatically named with my name here. Um, there I can type some answers. I can even come down here and insert a photo and get it on the web or upload it from my computer. I can put a drawing, um, lots of things. This is just a Google document that I can now turn it back into my teacher and she's gonna be able to see 20 different versions for my 20 different students. Okay, I'll click turn in there. And I think you get the idea there. So I'm gonna switch back to Katie. All right, a couple more things in create assignments. Um, oh, actually, let's do create a quiz this time. So create a quiz assignment. If you wanna make a self-graded Google form, this is the way to do it. When you try a new blank, or when you do a new quiz assignment, it just automatically gives you a blank quiz. And when you click on that, it's just like building a Google form. So you build the questions the same way you would outside of Google Classroom. And for each, um, each question that has a correct answer, then you can mark the correct answer on your answer key. You just do it as you're building it. So here where I clicked answer key, this is the correct answer and they would receive one point for answering that. And then I would do done. You can give them feedback if you'd like. You can also do ungraded questions. 
and you can do all the different question types that you normally can do on a form. But those ones where there is one correct answer or multiple correct answers, you just mark those on the answer key and then Google Classroom grades it for you. You can still title it here and change the background and all of that. And as you're building it here, it is ready to save in Google Classroom. So you can see it in um, your assignment. So it's still add additional title and text here and your grade, your points and your due date and all of that. It's, it's basically ready to go out to students so that you can click the assign button. And you can schedule those assignments too so that they come up um, in, in student feeds and in their classwork um, at certain times too. So I do have some samples down in here, but I really think that's enough to get you started at least and show you what's possible. Um, I guess the last thing would be, and you can do this again in the stream or in classwork, that you can just attach a material. So this might be a video you want them to watch or a screen recording, and you can just, again, attach that from your drive, or you can upload a file um, from your device itself, or you can go straight to YouTube. And this doesn't have a place for students to hand in. It's just an attachment that lives inside of their Google Classroom that you can add a context to or even send out an announcement to say, hey, go watch the video um, on this time or this date. So with that, I'll pause for just a second. And I, like I said, I'm not going super deep into this. So I know that um, the rest of questions might be able to be covered by the resources online. But if there's a, a, a question right now, I'll just pause and see if there's anyone that wants to ask it. Unmute and ask if you ever got a question. Good. And if not, that's fine. I'll just keep going. I appreciate that. We're going to move on now to our next big topic, which is Screencastify. And I have to really admit on this one, everyone, that um, I'm really falling in love with this free um, Chrome add on or tool that we can utilize in um, recording our screen or even recording videos because we can do it straight out of chrome out of our browser um, it automatically saves to the videos that we create with screencastify it automatically saves it to our google drive and or youtube which is really a time saver when we're teaching remotely from home um, and there's just some really nice options like the ability to do picture in picture that you can just turn on inside of the app as well. So I know that last week we talked a lot about recording with Zoom or recording with QuickTime on our Mac, and that is great too. But if you don't have access to, if you're on a Chromebook, you don't have those options. So um, what you need to know about Screencastify, this is the short version of what you need to know. It is a free extension that lets you record your screen or audio or even just a video if you have a, a web camera. You can make as many videos with the free extension that you want, but it can't go above five minutes with the free version. Um, and it does save those videos directly to your Google Drive. So you don't need to save them on your machine and then upload them later on. Um, however, because of the time we're in right now, there is a free, unlimited access to Screencastify where you don't have that five minute Re, um, recording limit and you can do some additional editing and trimming features too um, and what you need to do is click on this link that I've copied and pasted into this document with Screencastify resources and it looks like you're buying a pro version but you're not you don't have to put in any credit card or anything you just use this code and it's free and then you say activate license so I've done that already and so my Screencastify um, Chrome extension is already um, installed. And it's actually, you can probably see it where, up here where my mouse is circling around right now. And if I click on that, I'll be able to use it to show you how to do a Screencastify. If you don't want to activate the free um, unlimited version, then simply go to the, the Chrome um, app store the 
add that extension on and install it up there in your Chrome browser. When you click on it, you have three choices. You can record just one browser tab. So if I just want this particular you know, Chrome tab, or I can do my entire desktop. So it's getting everything that I do on my computer, or I can do um, just the web camera. So again, if I just wanted to record a quick um, message to my students using the web camera, I would just be like recording a video of myself. Here's the microphone and you can see it is picking up my audio right now and you can decide sometimes maybe you don't want to record the microphone with it. You just want the clicks on the, the desktop screen. And this is for the picture in picture. If you embed that webcam and you can turn that off and on during your recording as well. So really all you're choosing right now is if you want one browser tab or your whole computer or just the camera. And I'm choosing the desktop and I'm going to click record. It's going to count down for me um, three two one here in a second and hopefully this will all show up for you guys as well because we're like layering screen recording here and you can see my picture in picture down in the bottom corner which you can actually move that around too and you can resize it and then you can toggle it off and on with this little video camera down here so i'm just gonna click that off and then click it back on so sometimes it's really nice for your students to see an actual video of you talking while they're watching your screen or you teaching um, whatever it might be, explaining them how to, showing them how to, to navigate a website. Um, but sometimes you don't want that on. So that's controllable down here. You can also mark up the screen. There's a, a pen so you can draw and annotate while you're teaching and then turn that off as well or go back to the, the arrow pointer and I really like this feature underneath the arrow the mouse pointer it's kind of like a spotlight so that as I'm moving my mouse around what shows up on the screen recording is this um, lit up section where the rest is dark I'm probably going to turn that off for a second right now though so that we're just seeing this okay so you can see when I scroll my screen the screen recording is also scrolling Whatever I um, do and say is tied to that screen recording. And I'm just going to go ahead now and stop my, my, um, my screen recording. I hope I hit the right stop button there. There's so many stop buttons on my screen right now. There we go. And this shows my untitled screen recording that I just did. It's a great idea to name that right away. My first screen castify. There we go. Um, we can, whoops, sorry. I'm going to pause that there. We can trim it a little bit. Sometimes you want to just like pull off the ends a little bit. Apologies there. Um, we'll hit cancel on that. It's playing back to me there. Um, but it's already started saving to drive automatically, which, like I said earlier, is super nice. I don't have to take that extra step to upload it to my Google Drive. Depending on your home bandwidth, that'll take a little bit of time or a lot of time um, and then you can see that progress bar and when it's done you can click this copy shareable link button which changes it so that when it's in your drive it's shared so that other people can view it because if you know by using Google Drive in the past if just because you upload something doesn't mean that somebody else can view it you have to share it first or get that shareable link so that's what this is doing here for my video um, you can also send it to YouTube straight away with this publish to YouTube button down here. You have to wait for it to come all the way to drive first, and then you could put it on YouTube or share it to classroom or get an embed code. If you're a Google sites type of a person, you can also download it. If you have a, uh, a machine that has a hard drive and you want to download it and do additional editing, maybe put it into another video editor. You can, but really you don't need all of that to get a message to your students. Just start Screencastify, record something, send it to Google Drive and copy that link and then send that link to your parents or your families. So I really, really, really um, am liking this tool as something that's simple and easy for teachers. I'm going to close out of this tab right now and take you back over to um, the resources. I embedded a different video here from Eric Kurtz that you can just watch in line. 
Um, and I think it's about eight minutes and he kind of shows those tools more professionally than I just did. But if you really want to try it, that's all you need to get started along with that, um, the, the link to, to activate the um, pro version. So consider recording videos or your screen or just messages um, with Screencastify. And I'm sure there's other extensions and other um, add-ons that you can use, but this one seems to be a great um, solution for our time right now. And then I'm just gonna go ahead and go into YouTube, but feel free to holler if you do have questions. Um, YouTube in the past was recommended often for videos because of the fact that if you have a school Google account, you have a YouTube channel. And oftentimes both students and teachers forget that. I'm just gonna go to youtube.com right now. So this, think of this in, in terms of two-way sharing. Um, not only can you share your videos with your students, but if students are handing a video back to you, um, it might be just as easy to upload it to their YouTube channel, their school account, Google account, YouTube channel, and then share that link back with you. Um, I'll, I'll show you the options here, but it's really as simple as when you go to YouTube and you make sure you're signed in to your, your school Google account, then you have this plus create a video button. Now, the first time you come here, you might have to answer a couple of questions about setting up your channel and you can kind of skip over some of the, the prettying it up and just get to where we can get to this upload a video button. Um, and you can use um, an app version of the, of the YouTube app as well and create a video right into YouTube. But here is where I've created it somewhere else and now I'm going to upload it. So I just select the file from my computer and I go ahead and upload that video to my YouTube, YouTube channel. Yep. While you're doing that, I might say that if you um, upload directly into YouTube, then there's no editing. Am I correct? Right. If you use that, that's right, Molly. If you use that um, YouTube app on an iPad or a tablet, you can just pull up the camera and you can go straight to, it's called YouTube Create. Um, but then you can't edit it. So that's maybe a downside, but maybe it's okay too. In this time, none of us need to be worried about professional polished videos. It's more about the message and more about the information we wanna share. Good reminder, Molly, here's the description for that video that I'm uploading. And when it gets all the way up there, it'll suggest a thumbnail, but I can choose a different one or upload a different one too. I can select a playlist that it goes to if I want, or you can just leave that blank too. Um, and mark it as yes, it's appropriate for kids so that it it um, complies with um, COPA. And um, obviously that would be um, just to eliminate them questioning it. And then you can go ahead and go through this step one, two, and three, even though the video isn't done because it's trying to upload now. Um, but I can still go ahead and I don't usually do anything in, in video elements in the, the two step. It's just really not necessary. It's just extra um, making it look nice. But this step three, the visibility, this is important. These are your three options for any video you upload to your YouTube channel. If you said it is public, everyone can see it. If you said it is unlisted, anyone who has your link the link that's right over here or the link that's up in the browser bar when you're viewing a youtube video um, anybody that they have that link they can watch it but they can't just randomly search for your video in youtube and then private is completely private so i know that some teachers have been hoping that they could put videos into their youtube channel keep them private and then only their students or families could see them. And unfortunately, no, private is only, oh, only you. So basically, um, you would wanna do that unlisted feature if you're at all um, worried about it being searchable and people, random people finding it and learning something from third grade math that <laughs> they maybe didn't wanna learn. But I don't know why. Um, don't feel bad about putting an instructional video public for one thing, it's gonna be saved on your YouTube channel. You might use it again someday. And like I said, if somebody else wants to learn from you, um, all the more power to all of us 
in a way. Um, but I do get like, you don't want any private information in that video. Um, so be really uh, conscientious of what you're putting into YouTube in that public space. So once you've chosen this and you've saved it, I'll just do this one for right now. There we go. Then it'll give you a progress bar and it'll tell you how much time is left before that is finished uploading. And then you can come back and, and edit it later on too. And you're, so this will show all the videos you've uploaded to your channel. You can do some additional customizing of your channel. I'm going to cancel this upload because I don't need to take bandwidth to upload an extra video right now. Um, you can make it look nice for the people who are viewing it, but you also don't have to. When people visit YouTube now and um, they search for your name and find your Katie Morrow at ESU8 account, they'll see your most recent uploads here. This is your channel, basically. Or they can go to videos and, and see all of them. So there is, um, I mean, it's, it's not hard. It's a great option. Um, you can save videos and share videos other ways too. But if you've got some media and you got to get it out to people, just having it on your machine isn't enough. It might be worth taking a few minutes to set up your YouTube channel and you can maybe use it down the road as well. There's some additional information on this document that I linked here. Um, it might be a little bit outdated because it's from a few years back, but the uh, general gist of it is definitely still applicable here. All right, we're doing pretty good on time. Um, our next couple topics are a little bit shorter. This one is Google Meet and Google Hangouts Meet is the tool that is an alternative option to Zoom. I've been so impressed with educators the last few weeks as people are getting comfortable not only using Zoom for video conferencing, but also teaching with it, setting up meetings and um, meeting with their students or other faculty members or even family members in that video sharing format. But the reality is, is that one tool isn't always the only tool or the perfect tool. So if down the road you want an additional option for having that kind of video um, conferencing space, this is the free one that comes with our Google accounts. Um, it does have a few differences, and so I'll try to point out a couple of those. But really, it's as simple as I'll just do a new tab here. Um, in those little dots, and this does need to be enabled by your Google Apps for Education Administrator or your, um, yeah. So if it's not turned on for some reason, then you may um, have to talk to your IT people and make sure it's turned on, um, especially for students. It's probably on for um, teachers. It replaces the old Google Hangouts. It's now called Meet, and you can access it through that little menu that shows all of your Google Apps, or you can go to meet.google.com. Um, a really cool feature about it that's different than Zoom is you can go straight to your Google Calendar and just start a new calendar event. Let's say Thursday at 3 o'clock, we're going to have a Google Meet. And so if you just schedule it on your calendar, you can attach the Meet video conferencing right there. You do have to have the people that participate need to be under your same domain, so have Google accounts from your same organization. And so um, it keeps it a little bit safer, but also a little bit harder to do it across, um, like if you have students from another um, domain or something like that. I'll just call this Katie's Meet. Whoops, there we go. Oh, I can't use an apostrophe. Okay, there we go. And I'll continue. And now I've just started, like I started a Zoom meeting. Um, there's my built in webcam. I can turn it off and turn it on. I can turn the microphone off and on just like I can in Zoom. And no one else is here right now, but I'll go ahead and join my own room anyway. Okay, and here's the invite information. If I didn't start it on my calendar and invite them with a calendar event, I could just copy this information here and send it out to my students or type them in here. I could invite people from my Google domain, um, invite Molly to join in which I would do, Molly, except um, we don't want to try the bandwidth here, too. So we'll just imagine we've got multiple people in here, or even if we don't, it's just me, myself, and I, and I'm recording a video in Google Meet, that's possibility, too, because I can share my screen 
That's with this present button in the bottom right. Again, my whole screen or just a window. So I could pull up a website, pull up a document, teach on top of it while my students are listening and be able to ask questions in live time. Um, I do like this feature of Google Meet. It's just turning on the closed captioning. So once I toggle that on here, there we go. It's now picking up my uh, voice and trying to auto caption it. So that's super nice. I don't know if, Molly, do you know if Zoom will do that? Has that feature? I'm getting confused with all of the options lately. It has a closed caption feature, but I don't know if it does. If it does it live. I haven't used it. Okay. But there is a closed caption feature. Yeah, I know. Right. So it might be a possibility in other tools. I know um, there are like Google Slides will auto caption too. If you're um, presenting a slideshow, it'll automatically um, try to dic use your voice dictation. But this is nice inside of Google Meet as well. I'm going to turn that off. Um, there's the invite, invite information. Oh, and there is the chat on the top right so that the, people could have the back channel while you're teaching it. Again, this is just another good option. Um, it's not a no one perfect solution to video conferencing, but I'm going to go ahead and close this tab. It's just worth checking worth checking out if we have some issues with Zoom down the road for you and your class anyway. All right, so our um, last little section here is just working with paperless um, learning artifacts. So, and I know you probably know this, but again, I'm just trying to start really, really simple. If you've got a web article and you wanna make that a PDF, this one is about um, food deliveries safe during the coronavirus pandemic, we can just in Chrome, turn it into a PDF by trying to print it. So if we go to file and print, this is probably just a good reminder for everyone, but you change that printer destination instead of any printer there, you save it as a PDF or you save it to Google Drive. And then it becomes that file, that material that you can attach to an assignment and share that way. Okay, so if I hit save as PDF, then I'm gonna be able to say where it goes and adjust some of the settings and then hit save. So that's one way. Um, also, if you're using your phone as a scanner, and um, especially I recommend if you have an iPhone to use the built-in scanner in the notes app. You can see last week's um, recordings for information on how to do that or ask us later. It turns it into a really nice PDF that you can then share um, that way from pictures. So if you took, um, you know, your workbook or your, your book that you had at home and you wanted to take pages and digitize them, just scan them with your phone and then attach them to Google Classroom or wherever you're sending out your information. And then I lastly want to show you how, because I've gotten this question quite a bit, how to mark up Google, um, how to mark up PDFs with um, this plugin called Cami. And Catlin Tucker has a nice blog post to just um, kind of lay out the basics of annotating. This is both for you and especially for your students. So if students are, um, you send out a PDF and then you want them to highlight or annotate or type answers to questions right on it so that they don't have to print it out at home and then write their answers and then scan it or take pictures of it to send back to you. It's just keeping it all paperless and all digital. So I'm gonna show you how to use Cami from within Google Classroom. And actually for this, I'll switch over to my, my student um, account here, my person. And we'll go back to the home or the classwork feed here. And I put in a, an example PDF assignment. And I, I do have to let you know that you need to install Cami ahead of time so that it shows right here. So it says open with Cami on the top of any PDF. I already started this one kind of as an example for you. Um, but when students get that PDF through Google Classroom, they'll have to know that they can click on that open with Cami. And now they have all these extra tools running across the left-hand sidebar here 
so they can use their mouse to to draw or to write with their trackpad they can just type um, with using a text box they get all kinds of colors they can use shapes they can highlight and mark up text so there's all kinds of features there and anything that they do on this page um, basically sticks to the PDF because I sent it out as a Google Classroom assignment. Every student got their own copy, and now it's it's just basically saved. Um, you can see here in the Cami toolbar. This this is these are Cami tools here that they could print it, they could save it, they could save it to their they could download it to their machine, um, they could share it with other people not in the um, not in the Google Classroom, not just their teacher, and they could open a different file within Cami. But the nice thing is now that we have um, made our changes, made our edits to this document, we've put in our answers on it. When I'm in Google Classroom here, I can just hand it in like that. So um, here's my assignment. It's assigned, whoops, sorry, I'm looking at it as a student here and then over here on the right so it's attached my work is attached where i marked it up in cami and then i would turn it in that way um, so everything else is the same as before but it started with a pdf that typically wouldn't allow students to type answers on it and because they installed cami they can so i'm going to switch back here to my um my teacher person and see if I can get to Google Classroom here. Getting too many tabs open. I'll just start it again here. Um, you can install Cami to yourself. Like on this account, I don't think I've, I've installed Cami. Um, but just go to the, the Chrome App Store, actually here. So we'll go to our, oh. Yeah, because I've installed it on a different one. There we go. Ticket extension. Yeah, so the extensions. Oh, they've got great information here, too. This would be great. Oh, and they even have a free school wide upgrade. So Molly's reminding, you know, just go to your where you manage your extensions and then you'll get it installed just like Screencastify here. Yeah, Google extension, and then I put in Cami. And then it, you have to allow it for your account. And remember, your students will have to do the same too. So again, since they're not in person in the classroom, sending out maybe a, a screencastify of how to do that um, the first time that they, before they go to use it, wouldn't be a bad idea. I know some, um, Teachers have already used this with, with great success inside of their Google Classroom space. Students are already comfortable using it, which is great. So um, connect with those who do use Google Classroom. Definitely reach out to those in your um, immediate and professional network that can speak from experience. Here it is. Even without that, that free premium version, you can add it to Chrome and allow it and then use it in your any of your assignments, mark up your PDFs and your documents. So I, I, I think that's a great um, solution or a great um, feature to be able to take advantage of. Um, I do wanna mention these best practices that we've been saying all along. Um, just our advice to all teachers is keeping the content that they do share in either these screencasts or these videos or in Google Classroom Keep it short and keep it simple. Just choose the most important information and do make it personal. Like adding your own personal touch to the content is important. There's all kinds of content recorded by other educators already available through Khan Academy and all kinds of places. But our students need to hear you. They wanna hear their teacher teach it. So um, don't worry about making it perfect or, um, just get something there that they can connect to and feel like they're not so far removed from the actual classroom. I, I have additional things that I've run across that I thought might be worth mentioning and they might address additional questions. 
Um, this one is kind of cool. This is a whiteboard canvas. So if you're on a Chromebook and you don't have a um, actual, um, you know, an app to be able to draw on or teach your math problem, you could do a screencast here and just use this whiteboard space. It's still a trackpad and I realize that, but at least it's a place where you could sketch out some notes and some show some work and then have that be a part of your recording. So that was um, something that I ran across that I thought might be good. Um, also, and I didn't mention this earlier, I, I meant to, but how we were talking about using um, uh, Cami to annotate PDFs, if your students happen to have iPads, you don't have to have an iPad necessarily to do this, but you send out a PDF on Google Classroom, they can write and edit it in the Google Classroom app on iPad without needing that Cami extension. So that link is there. Um, closed captioning your Google Slides presentations. A good Google Classroom tutorial for parents explaining how they would log in at, from home to help their students or participate in their students um, learning on Google Classroom. And some additional settings for IT if you did want to use that Meet, that Google Hangouts Meet app. So with that, I've covered most of what I wanted to. I'm gonna stop talking and make sure that nobody else has any questions out of the group. Big or small, you can ask them now. Okay, so um, yeah, Peg asked about um, whitelisting a domain in Google Meet. Again, I'm not sure, and Molly's on the right track here. It might be possible to allow people from other domains to utilize Google Meet. And I don't know if that's a setting under your domain, but I, I do know that it's pretty locked down, and that's the reason why some people are choosing it, is because it doesn't have that open sharing um, capability that Zoom just kind of naturally has. That can be a good thing and, and a not good thing. I would need to dig into some more information behind it. We've talked to districts and, and asked them if they were using it or and a lot of them are just sticking with what teachers already know, which is Zoom. Sorry, Molly, go ahead. So it would have to be in your Google domain admin settings if, if it allows it. Yeah, Molly's voice for me is pretty garbled, but I think what she was saying is, in using okay, that link that I, and he didn't say anything about that so okay yeah in the admin it settings and yeah. that link would give you some more information to that too good it looks like we've got um no additional questions um but like always katie at esu8.org uh, molly.ashoff at esu8ne.org um, feel free to shoot us questions later on we'll just help you one-on-one -on -one. We'll jump on a Zoom and go through and do what we can to help you get your Google Classroom set up or maybe turn some different assignments um, into this uh, remote learning format um, or request other things that you would like to learn about. We can research it and try to share it with the group later on. We just really appreciate all everyone's efforts, everyone trying to reach out to their students and build that community across um, time and space borders. and. Um, it's really given some good opportunities. I, you know, my one final tip to everybody is um, not specific to Google. It's just with all of this. I'm really seeing the, the necessity for more collaboration than ever before in what we ask students to do. So I guess since this is a Google um, focused webinar, maybe instead of assigning individual assignments, assign them collaborative documents, assign them a small group set of slides so they're all contributing so that they can grab some social connections in their schoolwork um, because it's more important now than ever before that they don't feel independently isolated. So, you know, maybe that's for um, week two or week three, but like challenge ourselves to turn some of the learning activities into more collaborative ones since we can't be physically together, how can we use digital tools to have students do that? 
thank you all very, very much for attending. Have a great rest of your week, a great rest of your Wednesday, and we'll talk to everyone soon.